proteins go and on the endothelial cell they produce special type of sticky molecules these are called selectins what happened that previously if neutrophil was passing by there was no problem neutrophil will go and come back but now when neutrophil reaches here local endothelial cells in this inflamed area local endothelial cells are showing sticky molecules and complementary sticky molecules are also expressed on neutrophils so what really happens that previously if this is the blood vessel microcirculation in the pile blood vessel then arachnoid the blood vessel then cerebral blood vessel neutrophil come like this from arterial side little bit move and then go through venous side but now what will happen under the influence of these under the influence of these cytokines neutrophil will bring out their hands and from the endothelial cell also hands come and they will shake hands and neutrophil will stick there they hold the hand and they don't go so all these blood vessels will be and microcirculation will be attached with neutrophils and then cytokines will lead to attract the neutrophils chemotaxis of neutrophils and neutrophil will jump between the interendothelial gap gradually and slip into csl so what did you understand that chemokines and cytokines and other product were originally produced by our reactive cells to mediate the inflammation so that there should be more vasodilation increase permeability in microcirculation protein rich fluid should come with lot of antibody then complements and also extra vasodilation of neutrophil should come right this is a good intention so what happened lot of neutrophil come here antibodies come complement come is it right but bad things also happen what that this oxygen reactive species reactive oxygen species like peroxide or hydrogen uh, or superoxides or other things or nitric oxide and other things they start damaging local cells even they start damaging the neurons is that right local damage start excitatory neurotransmitters in high concentration also start damaging right and another thing happen these neutrophil which come here to help to kill the bacteria still they cannot kill the bacteria you know why they are supposed to eat the bacteria they cannot do it here effectively why they cannot do it because csf is fluid nature and in fluid nature neutrophil cannot phagocytose well they cannot eat well they eat well on the solid tissue classical example dr nadeem can you do, do dinner when you are swimming no simple as that if you try to imagine that you try to eat your dinner while you are swimming same way neutrophil cannot do phagocytosis well in what in fluid nature of csf so even though we build a lot of responses but usually these responses uh, our defenses which we bring they do less help to clear the bacteria and do unfortunately more damage to our own tissue am i clear to everyone what is going on yes sir right again repeat it step number 1 is colonization step number 2 is migration from mucosa mucosal cell to the blood step number 3 is survival in Circulation. circulation step number 4 is entry into csf csf step number 5 happy land multiply in csf no defenses and circulate into csf bacteria everywhere next step bacteria shedding Cell, cell wall components is that right and now the real action start our cells come surrounding cells what cells astrocytes microglia monocytes all of them start producing what cytokines and different uh, products like uh, oxygen free radical these all these products originally are produced with good intention to call the inflammatory response right but they also damage the local tissue they damage the Uh, brain parenchyma even and brain swelling will start but what really happen original purpose is build an inflammatory response and blood vessels dilate right increase permeability of microcirculation in uh, meningeal vessels and also cerebral vessels right protein rich fluid come into subarachnoid space and subarachnoid space become loaded with not only bacteria but lot of neutrophil and all these lot of neutrophil are unable to effectively phagocytose the bacteria and clear it that is why we say that we must do antibiotic antibiotic treatment very fast 
and such antibiotics should immediately go reach to the CSF and kill the bacteria otherwise our neurotrophil will keep on swimming around and not doing much you know all this damage to meninges and brain is less done by bacteria and more done by our immune response it's, repeat, it's worth repeating in most of the patient damage to our central nervous system and damage to leptomeninges is done less by bacteria and more by our own immune response am I clear more the bacteria release the toxic product more our local cell react and produce destructive products is that right now what will happen in this area what what changes will come into uh, CSF of course so many neutrophils so many bacteria so much proteins normally CSF is crystal clear but in this circumstances CSF will become cloudy do you think it can remain transparent no, no. so CSF will become cloudy and if you do the lumbar puncture the pressure of CSF will be normal or there will be high pressure of CSF high, high pressure why because more fluid is coming due to inflammatory exudate so opening pressure opening pressure of CSF or lumbar puncture will be high normal pressure in CSF is uh, six to eighteen centimeter of water or sixty to 180 millimeter of water this is the normal pressure of cerebral spinal fluid when you do the lumbar puncture in the patient in these patients in pyogenic pressure the opening pressure of CSF will be high and when CSF will come out through lumbar puncture you will see at physical it is not crystal clear it may be turbid it will be cloudy is that right what else if you look the CSF under the microscope you will find a lot of neutrophils under the microscope you will find lot of neutrophils and normally CSF should not have more than five normal CSF should have less than five cells per microliter right but here maybe hundreds or thousands of the neutrophils you see right you understand from where they came neutrophil rich CSF then plus then CSF protein normally CSF protein is low 0.2 to 0.4 gram per liter CSF protein level is 0.2 to 0.4 grams per liter here protein level should go up or down up, up. up because uh, due to increased permeability proteins are coming there so what is happening CSF become high pressure CSF become turbid, turbid and cloudy CSF become neutrophil rich it become rich in proteins and what about the glucose in CSF yes question goes to this young man okay next what happened to glucose level in CSF? Glucose will go down because bacteria is using glucose. Okay, so he is telling me that CSF glucose level will go down. First, you should remember one thing: whatever level of glucose is in the blood, CSF glucose level is less than blood glucose level normally. Normal person, healthy person, whatever the blood level of glucose is there, CSF level is somewhere between half to uh, two-third of the blood glucose level so when you do the lumbar puncture it is always good to also take the blood glucose level so that you should compare what is the blood glucose and what is the glucose level in the CSF but my friend is right that in this acute pyogenic uh, infection or meningitis CSF glucose level will go down but you have to remember normally CSF glucose level is less than the blood level but it becomes too much less less than half of the blood glucose level or we can say less than four, in children less than 60 milligram per DL and in adult CSF glucose level become less than 40 milligram per DL but ideally you should take the blood glucose level and glucose level in CSF the question is that in this patient why the blood glucose level sorry in this patient why uh, CSF glucose level will go down answer comes from yes man you have no idea okay yes you have no idea why in acute pyogenic bacterial meningitis of course why the blood uh, CSF glucose level is less than normal levels yes because Uh, 
metabolic needs of what? No, 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 I'm talking about CSF glucose level, not the blood glucose level. Yes. Okay, this is the most common answer when I ask the people that when there's acute pyogenic bacterial infection, why the CSF glucose level is very less? Because it has diagnostic value. We must know why. Most of the people tell me it is due to bacteria. They think bacteria are the babies which love the glucose. Partly this is right. But it's not the complete truth. Glucose is taken up by bacteria less and taken up more by our reactive cells. Our reactive immune cells love glucose more for their own metabolic machinery. You know, looking very active and doing nothing. Right? Neutrophils, monocytes, microglia, all of them which are very active, right? They actually take up a lot of glucose. That is a major reason that CSF glucose level drop rapidly in acute pyogenic and minor reason is that of course bacteria also love to have glucose. Who doesn't like the sweet? Right? Am I clear? Yes. Sir. So what did we came to know due to all this drama here, right? Micro drama and along with the immuno plane players, CSF pressure goes up, color become turbid. Yes neutrophil rich right too much neutrophils here normally there should not be even one neutrophil in csf and then glucose uh, proteins level go up due to increase permeability but glucose level go down because glucose is very rapidly metabolized by our neutrophils and our microglia and other cells which are reacting to the situation and of course some glucose is taken up by bacteria also Am I clear? All these things are happening and of course if you have taken lumbar puncture but remember before taking the lumbar puncture doing the lumbar puncture you must make it sure that there is no raised intracranial pressure pressure because if there is raised intracranial pressure and you do the lumbar puncture coning of the central nervous system can occur and immediate death can occur. It is bacteria didn't kill the patient but your lumbar puncture killed the patient. Right? So before doing the lumbar puncture you have to re be sure that there is no raised intracranial pressure. How we can be sure, we'll talk it later. But right now we concentrate that once the CSF is taken, right, pressure is high, color is turbid, tell me rapidly, protein level is high, glucose level is low, neutrophil count is very, very high. But remember one thing, uh, if neutrophil level is extremely high, then it may not be meningitis, it may be cerebral abscess ruptured into CSS. Not into CSF, into ventricular CSS. system. <laughs> okay, when neutrophil level is more than 100,000 per microliter, right? Anyway, then what you can do? Here I will talk about CSF also. Uh, you can take CSF and do microscopy, right? And staining, maybe by gram staining you can see the organism. Or you can to do latex agglutination test to identify the bacteria. And in some example, in uh, very modern laboratories, PCR, PCR polymerase chain reaction uh, analysis is available where they can even small amount of bacterial DNA can be amplified and we can recognize the culprit and organism. Is that right? But let's come back. So we were talking about that all immune system is reacting. Now what will happen due to all this thing? Next step. Up to now, we, I will just recap fast. Step 1, colonization. Step 2, migration to the blood. Step 3, survival in blood. Step 4, migration into CSF. Step 5, survival and proliferation in CSF. Step 6, release of toxins. Right? Step 7, which is very bad. Our system respond, which is going to damage us. 7, and step 8, inflammatory reaction come and protein rich exudation. Is that right? And tissue will become edematous. Tissue will become edematous. We call this vasogenic edema. What do you call it? Vasogenic edema. That will develop. Right? Another thing. Not only vasogenic edema develop, another edema develop. You know what is that? The vascular blood supply to brain will be disturbed now. Now it's worth mentioning the mechanism. What really happens that when too much neutrophils are here and in subarachnoid space, 
too much protein rich fluid is here the arteries which are entering into central nervous system they come under pressure now again listen very carefully okay let me make it like this this is suppose these are foramina these are foramina right and here are the arteries going into central nervous system to the foramina and here is your subarachnoid space around it is it right there are dural sleeves and subarachnoid space now what happen in subarachnoid space pressure is going up and protein rich and neutrophil rich exudate is there is that right now listen one thing when initially in the beginning when cytokines were released and chemokines were released and many toxic products were released inflammatory reaction start these blood vessels will initially dilate and blood flow to the central nervous system will increase will increase but very soon when lot of exudate is formed this exudate will press the blood vessels and then blood flow to the cns will decrease, decrease. so what happened in this patient in the beginning blood flow increased due to vasodilation which is mediated by the chemical mediators and later on when exudate become too much this exudate compresses the blood vessels and blood flow decreases even at advanced stage not only neutrophil came out of the blood vessels not only neutrophil fill up what is this subarachnoid space even neutrophil and protein rich material and bacteria especially neutrophil they infiltrate the blood vessels for example here is an artery here is an artery right and here is a suppose vein what happened neutrophil in the beginning were coming out of the artery right arterial side so the, in the beginning uh, neutrophil will be found perivascular okay then later on they will be found if they will fill up subarachnoid space or cs space and more later stage a neutrophil become too much they become too nasty out of control you know what they do they do something which they should not do but they do what they do they start infiltrating back into arterial walls and venous walls that's a very severe meningitis right they infiltrate the arterial walls and venous walls and so infiltration of arterial wall plus compression of arteries due to exudate blood flow to cns will decrease that will produce ischemia hypoxia general damage to the central nervous system auto regulation of cerebral blood flow is lost and destroyed you know auto regulation of uh, central nervous system it in such a way that blood flow to the cns is maintained appropriately even though there is major fluctuation in blood flow in systemic circulation but what happen when fast blood vessels are initially abnormally dilated and later on abnormally compressed and infiltrated so blood flow to the cns cannot be regulated well so we say auto regulatory mechanism of blood flow to central nervous system collapse right multiple area of ischemia develop that is one reason that with meningitis many people develop fluctuating conscious level irritability drowsiness attacks of fits seizures even coma you are understanding what's going on so when vascular mechanism is disturbed meanwhile brain start become swollen and edematous brain start swelling and you know skull is a tight box and if brain is swelling inside it is a dangerous thing because then intracranial pressure will go up now why the brain will swell one mechanism i have already told inflammatory process and vasogenic edema because when interendothelial gap appear protein rich fluid is exuding out that is vasogenic edema but there are other other edemas also so in this whole process number one there is vaso genic yes edema number two there is another edema which is called interstitial edema inter interstitial edema in central interstitial edema now let me before i explain what is interstitial edema and how it is different from vasogenic edema i want to explain another thing so you know what really happens when too much neutrophil have come out here and too much protein this neutrophil and protein and bacteria all of them eventually st st get stuck into these drainage pipe you know csf was draining back 
it was made by the choroid plexus circulating throughout and draining by the choroid plexus all these area become loaded with neutrophils and many protein rich material then so do you think this will drain well when it will not drain well the little obstruction will develop and pressure on csf will further go up so pressure on csf go up due to blockage here this is also called hydrocephalus communicating hydrocephalus secondly also pressure is high due to vasogenic edema and brain swelling when C csf pressure goes up when csf pressure goes up csf the fluid also accumulate in the brain parenchyma when pressure in the cfs csf is high the brain parenchyma fluid also enlarges because it cannot drain well on that side or even it goes into interstitial area so that is called interstitial edema one is vasogenic edema which is produced by vasodilation and increase permeability of microcirculation then there is interstitial edema of brain parenchyma due to raised csf pressure right and then there is another edema third mechanism of edema here is cytotoxic edema cyto toxic edema you know what we are talking it's life and death better for the patient cytotoxic edema what is cytotoxic edema any doctor here can explain it to me yes No, no, no. Tell me something more genuine. This is your personal theory, I believe. <laughs> cytotoxic edema. What is cytotoxic edema? Okay, let me tell you. Uh, oh, no. Before you tell me new things, listen. In cytotoxic edema, what really happened, let's suppose it's the brain parenchymal cell, right? Every cell has a lot of sodium potassium ATPases. So that potassium is, const uh, sodium is constantly pumped out. Every cell, almost every cell has sodium potassium ATPases. Now, sodium potassium ATPases utilize ATP. What they use? ATP. ATP. Now, listen carefully. Do you think blood flow is good to the central nervous system? Central nervous system is hypoxic and not right. When there is less oxygen coming here, can the cell produce ATP? No. If they cannot produce ATP, can they run the sodium potassium ATPases? No. no. Again, auto regulation is destroyed blood flow to central nervous system is reduced oxygen supply to brain parenchyma is reduced with low oxygen they can produce less ATP with less ATP they can uh, this pump sodium potassium ATPases become slow so sodium cannot be pumped out of the cells so cells become retain the sodium when they retain the sodium they also keep water, water and cells start swelling. swelling this is called cytotoxic edema this is called cytotoxic edema so you can imagine that parenchymal cells are start swelling so cells are swelling right due to raised pressure in csf there is also edema which is interstitial edema and cell are swelling this is cytotoxic edema and in the beginning due to increase microcirculation permeability there was vasogenic edema all these edemas together lead to brain swelling and all this system will damage your central nervous system function and patient will develop irritability as I told you patient will develop drowsiness patient uh, may develop uh, seizures patient may develop confusion right disorientation in time place and person and eventually patient may go into coma patient may go into coma now these are the events just before death intracranial pressure is now high and features of into raised intracranial pressure will also appear in the patient and if still you don't take care of the patient well what will happen herniation herniation will start in the brain that you know around here is tentorium cerebelli what will happen that swelling will develop in the brain and it will herniate and when it will herniate down what are what is this uncus of the temporal lobe so when they will herniate through tentorial gap they will press which cranial nerve please tell me third cranial nerve i need to make a diagram or you understand it you understand it anyone who does not understand it okay just let me make a rapid diagram look this is the okay here is your tentorium cerebelli is that right 
mid brain is here his mid brain above it if mid brain is coming out of this place upward upward on the side there's uh, temporal lobes now when intracranial pressure become high the mid brain is here like this right temporal lobes are here and here the third nerves are going right now what happens temporal lobes temporal lobes are like this right this is frontal lobe here is parietal lobe here is occipital lobe and this is temporal lobe these are two temporal lobe the pressure will become high the temporal lobe will press the what is this mid brain and third nerve when third nerve is pressed first pupil become meiotic and then it become midriatic first it constrict and then it dilate why very good excellent excellent very good what's your name Ali Hassan very good so Ali Hassan is telling us that when third nerve is irritated in the beginning it over fires you know irritated man over fires even woman too much over fire and they irritated so what happened third nerve over fire and it has pupiloconstrictor fiber parasympathetic so pupil constrict but if pressure remain too much then this nerve become totally dysfunction and then what happened it stop working and pupiloconstrictor action of the third nerve is lost and pupil dilate so pupil will constrict and eventually dilate these are very important changes and in these patient with meningitis you keep on looking at the pupil is it reacting to light normally or not and is it undergoing constriction or eventually dilation or not right so herniation can develop over here and uh, what is this third uh, pupil changes and with that maybe temporal lobe it press the cross cerebri or mid brain and that will lead to contralateral ipsilateral third nerve damage and contralateral hemiparesis and hemisensory loss right these are the features of herniation but if herniation occur at the level of cerebral tonsil at foramen magnum that is very very dangerous because the tonsils of what don't tell me the tonsils from palatine area tonsils of cerebellum they try to herniate down through from an magnum and press the medulla and that will produce dysfunction uh, in the you can say medullary function patient will have up going babinski sign patient will have also yes tell me tell me tell me respiratory changes there is respiratory center in medulla very very important and vasomotor motor centers blood pressure will have major fluctuations this is just before death by the way and his respiration will be disturbed chain stroke respiration right and if still you cannot do anything heroic patient is going to die is that right so and here i didn't tell you that if uh, there is too much pressure on mid brain there is ascending reticular formation if that is compressed patient will go into deeper coma is that right so what i was telling you these are all problems developing in a patient with meningitis eventually if patient survive but still some complications can be there and what could be those complications number 1 if there is too much gelatinous exudate which is seen especially in pneumococcal infection because pneumococci are very thick what capsules a lot of polysaccharides are released if those polysaccharides make thick and gelatinous exudate in subarachnoid space later on subarachnoid fibrosis develop adhesions develop right and if this exudate stuck over here and damage the villus uh, what is the arachnoid villi and granulation that will produce hydrocephalus so one of the complication can be hydrocephalus then sometimes uh, if there is fibrosis of the arachnoid tissue chronic adhesive arachnoiditis chronic adhesive arachnoiditis that may entrap some cranial nerves that may be damaged in some unfortunate patient even cranial abscesses may develop cerebral abscesses may develop usually uh, pia mater is a very good defense but if it uh, in very fulminant cases it break down and abscesses may develop right then other complications which can develop over there are that uh, there can be yes what we have talked what complications number one hydrocephalus can develop then abscesses can develop then 
Cranial nerve entrapment can develop. What else can be there? Right? Fits can develop. Fits, fits mean scissors. But before I go that, I want to discuss a little morphology. If you look at this brain, grossly, and uh, what is this? Uh, meninges. Meninges will be swollen and opaque. Right? This will be opaque. Right? And you will find exudate right in multiple areas accumulated in pneumococcal in pneumococcal infection exudate specially accumulate around the sagittal sinus or at the top of the brain but in in case of hemophilus influenza exudate is mostly made at the base of the brain pneumococcal pneumo mean air so they are like air they are going up so exudate is at the top of the brain and hemophilus influenza that is at the base of the brain plus exudate tracks around the blood vessels right and if you see microscopically structures what's going on there if unfortunately someone dies or you see microscopically what changes are there it's easy to understand first of all you will find find a lot of neutrophils but in early case neutrophil will be around the blood vessels perivascular in more moderate cases uh, all subarachnoid space will be loaded with neutrophil and more fulminant cases neutrophil will be infiltrating the arteries and infiltrating the veins and when they infiltrate the veins they produce thrombophlebitis because in vein become inflamed we call it phlebitis and thrombus develop there we call it thrombophlebitis that will lead to stoppage of blood flow to many areas of the brain and even infarction can develop am i clear so the areas of again in early cases, morphologically, we will find neutrophils around the inflammatory cell, around the blood vessel. Then we will find lot of neutrophils in the CSF, right, in the CSF. Then we will find eventually infiltrating into the walls of the blood vessel. And eventually you may find lot of neutrophils have entered into, what is this, brain substance, parenchyma, in very advanced stages. This is called what? Cerebritis. What is it? Cerebritis. Cerebritis. And if it becomes chronic situation, patients survive, it may convert into abscess if it becomes encapsulated. Any question up to this? Even in some patient, ventricles become inflamed and we say that there is ventriculitis. Right? Any question? I know it was a little complicated. So now you will tell me the steps. Step number one is colonization. Step number two is migration through mucosa up to circulation. circulatory system. Say loudly. Number three is survival in circulation. circulation. Number four is migration to CSF. CSF. Number five is survival and multiplication in CSF. CSF. Number six is release of Cytos. toxins. Number seven is response by our system which makes a major damage which cells microglia astrocytes monocytes and uh, endothelial cell number seven number eight is release of cytokines and other toxic product number eight they damage a lot number nine is severe inflammatory response blood vessels dilate and increase permeability and lot of exudation protein rich and neutrophil team into all the csf what was this number nine and number 10 is yes auto regulation is lost auto regulation is lost first blood flow increases and then decreases is that right and what is this number 10, Ten. and number 11 is brain is undergoing edema what type of edema are there there is vasogenic edema there is interstitial edema and there is cytogenic edema and number 12 is raised intracranial pressure 13 is Herniation, 14th is eventually death. Coma and death, right? So here we stop today's lecture.